documentation. This is very exciting, right? Documentation, so we check the Coupa permit, and in San Diego County, we actually give them a binder. It's a, I should have brought one, but it, it's a, just a regular binder, and it comes with a table of contents, and it also has uh, separator sheets. And our first item would be the Coupa permit, and we give them a, the separator sheets. Uh, the tab says Coupa permit, and we actually put a copy of any, just a fake permit of the Coupa permit, and then when they get the permit, they actually put it there in the binder, and then we go to tab number two, and that would be the UST permit. It's a good way to have them, to help them, to have everything organized, and it's also easier for us to do the inspection, since we already know where everything is. And that also saves time, because we don't want them to hand us a, a, a box full of, just filled with documents, and just, hey, yeah, it's in there somewhere, just keep flipping the pages. We also check uh, financial responsibility. Are they relying on the state fund? If they are, they also need to have a CFO letter or chief financial officer letter because the state only provides up to $995,000 per, uh, per incident or for the cleanup. And the USD owner has to be able to say, I have 5,000 available for that one million that has to be covered. The CFO letter has to be updated every year. The financial responsibility, we can only have one copy and that's it, as long as they don't change their mechanism. If they decide that they no longer want to rely on the state fund, now they want to pay insurance, we need an update of the CFR. And we, we need to see a copy on site and we also want a copy in our records. If they have insurance, I'm not gonna take a copy of their insurance, but I wanna see their insurance on site, at least the policy that says that their facility is covered for as many tanks as they have. If they have three tanks on site and the policy only lists two, that's, uh, that would mark it as a violation because they are not showing me that they have coverage for the three tanks that they have on site. Um, on the USD permit, I forgot to mention, I would also check if, and I don't know if the, no, I do know. <laughs> on, the US, on the operating permit, I would check if that permit is actually listing the amount of tanks that are actually located on site. And that permit also says uh, the general characteristics of the tank, it's if it's double wall tank, if it's single wall tank, and how it's being monitored. I want to compare that to the actual uh, things that I'm seeing on site. Okay, so we also have to check the state forms. That would be the response plan, the monitoring plan, the plot plan, and also, I didn't put them there, the forms A and B, or facility page and tank pages. The response plan, that one, um, it, they just have to have the copy there. And in San Diego County, though, well, the state form says that they have 30 days to respond to any release into the secondary containment. In San Diego County, we only allowed 24 hours. So we just created our own form. It's the same form, we just changed that section. Or if the facility just gives us the state form, we just cross that out and write 24 hours and then we accept it with conditions saying it, they had to attain to that 24 hour restriction. The monitoring plan, we we do check for that. We have to make sure that the equipment that they're using in the monitoring plan is actually what we can observe on site. This monitoring plan is um, gonna give us information about the sensors that they have in their sumps, about lining detectors, about their overfill, UDCs. If there's any change, let's say a sensor failed and they replace it with another similar, that, that would be a good chance to revise that form. If I make revisions to that form, I'm gonna make a copy and take it with me as well. If, it, if it's the case that I need to make, I don't know, five revisions, I'm gonna ask them to fill another one and give me a good copy. And always when you do any revision to the form, just make sure that you put your initials and date or have them do it, whatever you want. We also check for the business owner operator identification as part of our business plan. 
We also check for the designation of UST operator. That one, they have to have it on site as well. They, we, they need to give us a copy. If there's any change on the DO or designated operator, they need to give us a copy within 30 days. If the DO certification has expired, they also need to update that one and send us a copy. And I don't, uh, I've seen that, they, I, I don't know, they forget to do that very frequently. But is it a big violation? If, what do you think? If they forget to, re to update the DO form? Come on, wake up. It, it's a violation, but it can be corrected fast, and we're not putting in danger the, the environment or the public, are we? I, that's not a big violation. That can be taken right care right away, and especially if we can go online and check if, if that DO is certified, it's just a form that is missing. I mean, it's just the, the new signature and the new date there. It's a violation, just get a copy, but it's not a big deal. Uh, we also check the monthly designated operator reports. What do we have to check there? We have to check that the information is complete in regards to, it has to have the facility address, has to have the DO's name, his certification, his phone number. That phone number is important because sometimes they don't even, they never see the UST owner or the UST operator. They just go there to the, to the site, they take a look at, at the alarm history, they take a look at the fill buckets, UDCs, and they write the report, and they just leave a copy there. And, and so if you might be asking the, the person in charge, hey, what happened on this given date? I don't know, and, but maybe the DO remembers so you can give them a call and ask. Yes, sir? Do we need a wet signature in the DO page? A anything. We need a signature there. It can be just hand printed or, or an electronic signature. <coughs> I, if you're doubting that that DO is the one that is actually working there, just give them a call. Um, now, alarm history, they, have, they actually have to print one every month. We don't want copies from the previous month, even if there were no alarms. We want an alarm history printed out the day that he was there. And that alarm history has also to show the date that they were there. And alarm history would include all the sensors that are connected to the monitoring panel. If a tank, for example, is, and I, I don't know how familiar you are with the tapes. Are you familiar with them? Yeah, no, some of them, okay. Most of the sensors, normally they're labeled as L, so you would have a list saying L1, L2, L1 for 87 fill sump, L2 for 87 STP sump, and then just keep going as according to how many sumps they have, or UDCs. Sometimes they also have a C, a label as for C for annular sensors, because they just work different in a different way than those sensors in the secondary containment in the sumps. DOs, sometimes they forget those also. So they, they're so used to just print the L sensors that they forget the C sensors. Or they forget that they have also to run a CSLD test. That's not part of the DO report, the CSLD test, but that's a good way to keep them and so they don't lose track of that. Just to keep a copy of the CSLD result within the monthly report of the DO next to the tape of the alarm history. And they also have to provide training to employees. That training has to be given once a year and for new hires within 30 days of being hired. Now that's, that's easy to, they can give us a list of all the employees, all the names and the day when they were trained and this is what's covered. Oh yeah, okay, let me ask you. What would you do if there's any spill? And, and if that person doesn't know, what would you do if, if that system comes in alarm right now? Oh, I just turned the, I just pressed the red button. Well, yeah, and then what, what else? Um, or even worse, what's bitter root? What's that? <laughs> that that's not good. <coughs> even, even if we have a document ser there saying that they were trained, if they don't know, if they don't know how to answer simple questions, uh, that would give me uh, an indication that they have not received good training. Yes? What about them? We'll, he's asking what about the, the S sensors for vacuum sensors in the alarm history. We also want to see those. Just any sensor that is programmed with, 
it, through the monitoring system, we want to see it in the alarm history. OK, so CSLD results. If it's a single wall tank or single wall piping, we want to see also those results on site. They only need to have one passing result per month. That's easy, right? I have some sites that they don't even need the CSLD test, and they still do it. Now when it fails, they freak out. Because wh what do I do? <laughs> Maybe something, uh, I don't know, wiring issues that you don't even have to worry about because you don't have single wall system. They, just, they can just delete it. OK, now we also have for test reports. How many are we going to check? Well, they have to keep their records. For the USD monitoring system, they need to keep three years' worth of records. We are supposed to have copies in our files. They also need to have a copy on site for our review. If I, don't, if I didn't get a copy from the previous year, I'm going to get a copy right there. Um, secondary containment test. For that, the state doesn't tell us how many years. So we're, what I expect to see is the most recent one. If I was the UST owner, I would keep everything uh, for the at least three reports. That would be, what, nine years? That's, it sounds like a lot, but it's only three reports. But it, if they have the most recent one, they're covered. Spill bucket test. The spill bucket test is listed in a separate, apart from the monitoring system, because the spill bucket test is not actually a requirement of the monitoring system. That has to be done once a year, but they can do it whenever they want. Just make sure that they do it. And they also provide you a 48-hour notification prior to the testing. And you also need to get results. Um, other testing could be ELD, enhanced leak detection. That would depend on the system. If it's located within 1,000 feet of uh, drinking a public water system, they would need to have that one. If they have a single wall system, they would have to be doing the ELD test every three years. So we want to see three reports. The most recent report, if they have to do line integrity tests, we also want to see those results. Am I missing any report? that you may recall. You just want to make sure that they have their records. And uh, when they ask me, oh, I'm so confused. Some documents I need to keep them for three years, some others just one year. We'll just keep them all for three years. That way you're covered, right? OK, almost done. Do we need to check something else? Um, we do. We check docu all our documentation. We check the site map. We check the response plan. We check the contingency plan. I want to know that if there's any emergency, they know where to run to. I know that they, I need to know that they, if there's any fire, they know that they can just go to the next business that doesn't have any, I don't know. I, I don't want them to run next to the propane tank, right? <laughs> and, and that's a good also a question for the employees. Hey, and a good way to know also if they have been trained at least on, in that basic Hey, if there's a fire right now, where would you go? Okay, right here on the next to the parking lot or whatever. Okay, good. You're safe. Um, who would you call? That is part of the contingency plan. Do you have the phone numbers? Maybe you don't have them memorized, but do you have them on your cell phone? Do you know that you can call the police? Do you know you, do, do you, know you can call the fire department right away? Do you know how to get a hold of the USD owner or the USD, the business owner? And if there's any revisions on the usually cell phones or res uh, residential phone numbers, we would update that information right there. We also check for a waste manifest. Remember, I went to the DTSC website before my inspection, and I took a look at how many disposals they had during the past year. Now I want to see the reports on site. And what we check, I want to know that the facility disposed of their waste through a legally hauler. Now, I want to know that the hauler took it to a treatment disposal facility that is also uh, official or accepted, certified to receive that waste. Now, that facility that received the waste has to submit a copy to the generator, right? That's, that's, uh, that's a very common violation, that they forget to receive that copy. Or maybe they get it, but they just throw it away because they already have one, right? The original one. But the original one is missing the signature on the bottom saying that that waste actually ended up at a good facility or that is authorized to receive that hazardous waste. Um, OK, and we need to give an update to the person in charge. 
maybe we don't need to. I like to do it. Why? Because for each violation that I find, I'm, I have to write my report, right? Let's say it, wa it was the CFO letter, the chief financial officer letter. And if the owner is there, and I can ask him, hey, you're missing, you haven't updated this or you haven't revised it, he can do it at that moment, and I wouldn't write it down as violation. I can just make a comment saying CFO letter updated today. So that would save me a few words. <laughs> um, and also, as I mentioned before, if, it, if it's something in the system, as part of the system, any component that was failing, maybe he can start taking care of at that moment. If it was something in the system that failed, I would tell the, the, the person in charge before I start doing my, paper, my paperwork review. Almost, <laughs> really. <laughs> now this time I'm all, almost done. Now we have to write. What do I write? Well, in that CIR or compliance inspection report, I have to say what I'm there for. Okay, this is the annual inspection. This is the annual underground storage tank inspection. I have to say who gave me authorization to do the inspection. And not just saying um, John gave me permission. No, John Smith. <laughs> whatever the name, cashier, this person gave me permission. I, I had his consent to do my inspection. I also want to list the company that was hired to do the testing. And I also list that the technician is certified and that I reviewed his certifications. Then I start listing the violations that I, find, that I found. I list how it was supposed to be done. For example, a line lead detector. Lightly detector in 87 sump for 87 grade failed to detect what? A three gallon per hour leak um, rate test. And then I have to say this has to be corrected within this amount of time and I need to get results by this date, blah, blah, blah. Then I would make also a summary of whatever I, any other documentation that I observe or any, anything, any other details that did not that it wasn't necessary to make a, a violation that maybe like the update that I mentioned about the CFO letter. If they're doing a good job, if you didn't find anything wrong, it's also a good way to tell them good job, thank you. We, um, because th they're, they help us in writing less and they are actually helping the environment, showing that they do care, that they have everything current and working, functional. And very important, we need to explain the report to the person in charge. We just, we don't give them just a copy and here you go, read it and um, if you understand it, fine. If you don't, fine with me too, I'm living. No, we actually go through each violation and I like to make sure that they at least follow me. And if they're faking it, they, I don't know. <laughs> if they have any question, that would be a good opportunity for them to ask me, what do you mean with this? How can I fix this? Or does the technician who did the testing has to repair this? No, he can hire anyone he wants. If he wants to use the same contractor, that's fine. If they want to use someone else, that's fine too. Um, and they need to understand that they need to provide you also documentation showing that everything was fixed. Okay, so I leave that side. Now I can go to my office or do it. I don't know, now that we're in San Diego, we're gonna start doing, um, we're gonna be mobile inspectors. Are you guys doing that too? Yeah, no, no one, you do? No, you have a question. My question is how do you then document the inspection needed to make our Right now we do it handwriting, but we are moving towards doing it electronically tablets. with tablets. And the idea is to fill out the report in our tablet and actually email it to them. If they don't have an email, then we would, we would carry a printer with us and print a copy right there and give the copy to the person in charge of the station. And since I started here in the county of San Diego three years ago, they have been saying that we're moving that way and I haven't seen it yet, but <laughs> hopefully this summer. Okay, so I, I leave the site, I'm done with the inspection and I know I'm tired and I don't wanna think about this anymore, but I need to write it because uh, I don't want things to forget or I want to make sure that there is documentation in our office. So I'm going to process a compliance inspection report. We, um, hold on. We have a database called Kiva, and we're moving now to Acela. Are you familiar with those, or do you use another different databases? 
Well, whatever database you use, just make sure that you update it, input your comments. If the CFR was updated, it, you can update it right there, update the date, um, phone numbers, anything that you can do after the inspection, do it, or maybe you have um, personnel at, at the office that do it for you, go ahead, highlight it, tell them what has to be updated in the, in the database. Now, is the UST permit expired, or does it have to be renewed before I go there next year? If it has and they didn't have any violation, I'm gonna sign, um, I'm gonna give them a permit again. If there were any violations, I'm gonna hold on, on to the permit until I receive evidence that everything was corrected. If the permit is not, doesn't have to be uh, reissued, then uh, I don't worry. I'm gonna wait until next year. The, per the permit is good for five years, so we don't have to reissue it every year. Just make sure that it doesn't expire within your inspection and the next one that you're gonna be there next year. Um, do we need to do a follow-up? And that would depend up to the facility or the inspector. Do you wanna go back to the site and actually witness that whatever violation or whatever component wasn't working, do you wanna make sure that it, it's working now? And the more, when I do it most of the time is with line lead detectors. If I have a facility that has been having a line lead detector failing year after year, and they don't know why they just replaced the line lead detector, there might be something wrong with the construction of the, I don't know, the, the piping, maybe it's not on the right slope. If they are gonna tell me it passed now, but I've seen that it, that's what they have been doing for the last years, it fails and they replace it and it passes, uh, for, and it has happened two years ago, it happened last year, and then again. I'm, I'm gonna feel more confident if I just go back to the site and I actually witness that test. Do we need to charge inspection? We, we do charge re-inspection if we need a follow-up. Um, maybe the follow-up hasn't be, doesn't need to be done by me. Maybe I need a referral, like I mentioned before, a fire department. So I'm gonna just send, uh, we keep a good bank of uh, contact info. We need to have good relationship with fire marshals, with APCD, with stormwater. So if there's anything that you s observe that it, you consider is a violation but it's not within your jurisdiction, just pass it on to whoever is appropriate. Now, that was during the day of inspection and maybe the following day. Now. 30 days later, I'm gonna make sure that all correct, all violations have been corrected and then I receive all documentation. I'm gonna make sure that I receive a report of that testing that occurred the day when I witnessed it. And I, I'm already done. For the report, the person who has to give us the report is the UST owner or the UST operator, either or. If usually we get it from the contractor. If we don't get it, then I would be calling the UST owner or operator. Hey, I need a copy. And maybe I've heard from the contractor say, I, I have it here, but I, don't, I haven't signed it because they haven't paid me. Well, but then I would call the, the UST owner and hey, I need your report. That way they, I'm not trying to obtain money from them or having them pay the contractor, but I want him to get my, that report to me. And the only way he can get it is by paying him. So. That's between them, but I need that report with a signature. So I'm done until next inspection. Next inspection should be next year, but if there was something like a crash on their system, like a cold start or they needed to do any modifications, I might have to go back within two months. It would depend. But in an ideal situation, it would be until next year. So in conclusion, we the inspection is not just the inspection. We, we have to do it before, during, and after. Before we do our research, and we make sure that we have the necessary tools, equipment, forms, all documentation, that we actually reviewed everything. Then during the inspection, I'm gonna check the equipment. I need to make sure I'm there not to do testing, but to make sure that everything is working. I also need to check paperwork. Then they are actually keeping their records 
And after the inspection, I just need to make sure that I documented everything I observed. And I need to check that all corrective actions have been completed. And that's it. Are there any questions? Or what do we go next to, Gary? He's asking if why we issue cease and desist and not red tag. I, I just never seen a red tag, and I think a cease and desist is quicker. And with a red tag, where you're just preventing them to buy any more fuel, but they can actually get rid of it, right? They can keep selling. With a cease and desist, I'm gonna force them to close, so they cannot do any business. Now I, that way, they're gonna act quicker. So uh, we've seen that that's been working, and I think that's the reason why they we don't use the red text. The lady's asking if if we are doing an inspection and I need to take a picture of a UDC, can I use a cell phone? I, I do. I have a camera provided by the county, but I also carry my cell phone, and if the battery on my camera died, I, I'm gonna pull out my cell phone and use that one. Should I take more questions, or? Can we hold the questions up to the end? That's what I'm being ordered, I'm sorry. <laughs> He's asking if my, my agency tests the vapor buckets, we don't. Those are not required to be tested, and we, it's actually recommended by the state, but we do not require them. Thank you. Yeah.